Hello, welcome to another session of uh, Digital Slide Review and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, and our program is courtesy of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy and PATH presenter. Uh, the topic we're going to cover today uh, relates to a challenge uh, frequently encountered in surgical pathology in the GYN tract, which is uh, differentiating among the various uh, types of endometrial and other carcinomas that can occur in this location. So um, how do we use the various uh, advanced uh, immunohistochemical and to some degree molecular techniques that we have to help to differentiate these tumors, which uh, not infrequently have differing uh, prognoses and differing therapies. So um, when we think about the histologic types that are uh, occur in this location, uh, specifically within the endometrial uh, carcinoma category, uh, this is a short listing of the uh, recognized types from the recent WHO uh, Blue Book uh, and includes uh, the most frequent lesions, the endometrioid, serous, and clear cell tumors, as well as the less frequently encountered uh, entities like undifferentiated or dedifferentiated carcinoma, uh, squamous cell carcinoma, mesonephric or mesonephric like tumors, and the mucinous carcinomas of intestinal type along with the uh, variant that uh, in we encounter not infrequently, that of carcinosarcoma, which is included here for uh, completeness sake. Now, um, there are a number of circumstances when uh, immunohistochemistry is particularly useful uh, in these settings. And one of these is when you have a very high-grade tumor with a uh, totally solid or predominantly solid pattern. In these circumstances, we're thinking about possibly serous carcinoma, possibly uh, dedifferentiated carcinoma or undifferentiated carcinoma or a high-grade endometrioid tumor. Um, <clears throat> but other entities uh, occasionally come into the differential as well. And so that's one area, one circumstance where applying these immunohistochemical uh, tools can be very useful. Likewise, a number of tumors have clear cell areas or clear cell-like areas uh, that can be uh, deceptive and uh, potentially mislead one into thinking of clear cell carcinoma, particularly if there are ac accompanying high-grade nuclear features. Then there are the small glandular patterns that can sometimes be endometrioid, but may also be uh, mesonephric or mesonephric-like. Tumors that have sex cord-like features occasionally also occur in this location, uh, both stromal as well as other tumors, and can uh, masquerade as uh, carcinosarcomas or other uh, tumors in this uh, situation. And so understanding the differential for those is occasionally useful, not a frequently encountered problem. And then finally, germ cell and gestational tumors can oftentimes mimic uh, squamous cell carcinomas or uh, poorly differentiated adenocarcinomas, although these usually present in a somewhat different age group and with a somewhat different uh, clinical uh, presentation. So let's just take a look at a few uh, kinds of tumors that might uh, present the need for uh, evaluation using immunohistochemistry. Here's a more standard uh, tumor with uh, areas of nice glandular formation. Uh, but as you can see, some more solid areas here as well, um, uh, uh, sort of falling apart. Uh, and these have uh, sometimes uh, more frequently have little areas of uh, cytoplasmic clearing. Uh, as you can see here, which may begin to suggest the possibility of clear cell carcinoma. So uh, this combination of both a glandular component and a, a more solid component uh, can be deceptive and uh, a challenge for differentiation. Another case, another situation where we might think of this is uh, in an older patient. Uh, of course, uh, this is a nice classic example of serous carcinoma arising in a polyp. We see this background in this uh, patient. Um, but occasionally these serous carcinomas uh, are either um, uh, solid and not don't have the characteristic slit-like spaces. Uh, for example, here, these uh, look to have more of an endometrioid type of uh, glandular formation uh, with tall columnar cells in some areas. The nuclei are not uh, terribly high grade. Uh, and so even though this is the presentation where you would be thinking you know, nine times out of 10, this is going to be endometrioid, excuse me, serous endometrioid adenocarcinoma. Uh, because of the morphology, you can entertain the possibility of thinking about using immunohistochemistry. 
Um, uh, here's another example, maybe a little bit more classic. We see more of the irregular type uh, glandular spaces. Uh, and, and in this case, uh, you can see that probably this would not be a case where uh, you would be terribly confused, um, unless, of course, there were some areas that uh, had sort of a clear cell change uh, or stromal hyalinization or something of that sort that might make you think about a combined tumor and uh, or a mixed tumor. And sure enough, here you see areas of high-grade nuclei with perinuclear clearing, sharp cytoplasmic borders, that suggests the possibility of a clear cell component, um, in addition to these more classic areas of uh, papillary uh, serous uh, tumor with a nice high-grade uh, nuclei, prominent nucleoli, amidst a more columnar cell background. So you can see uh, all three of the different kinds of patterns in the dominant types here in this one slide in a very small geographic area. And so in these kinds of circumstances, uh, validating your diagnosis uh, or confirming it with immunohistochemistry uh, can become uh, very, very useful. Let's take a look at another example here. Uh, here's perhaps a more uh, classic example of a uh, clear cell carcinoma, uh, which even from the low magnification, you get a sense there's not a lot of, of pink cytoplasm here. Uh, there uh, is, however, a sense of pink stromal hyalinization, fairly characteristic of uh, clear cell carcinoma. And as we come into higher magnification, we can see uh, relatively high grade nuclei, uh, perinuclear or cytoplasmic clearing, uh, areas that uh, suggest hobnail formation with apical nuclei. So these are features uh, that would be uh, strongly morphologically suggestive of clear cell carcinoma. Um, and uh, in many settings may not require histologic, or excuse me, immunohistologic confirmation, uh, but if available, uh, certainly can be uh, prudent um, in uh, most situations. And then here is the classic uh, dilemma that I mentioned right at the start, a quite solid tumor with a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, slit-like spaces here, but obviously some very clear, or excuse me, solid areas and then a suggestion that we're getting a stromal transformation. So here we see uh, the glandular component uh, with these irregular angulated spaces. Um, if we get into higher magnification, we can see uh, the nuclear features are relatively high grade, uh, abundant mitoses, coarse uh, nucleoli. Uh, but then this more solid area becomes interesting in this situation because uh, we see a little different pattern here uh, and so this mixed kind of pattern raises uh, a number of possibilities. And then the stroma, uh, it almost looks like there's a mesenchymal or a mixoid change to the stroma here, uh, maybe with some atypia. So is this a uh, sarcomatous transformation in a uh, serous carcinoma or is something else going on? And here we can see more of the spindle cell proliferation, even with more of a almost smooth muscle type of appearance to these uh, cells with more pink cytoplasm um, and uh, a degree of atypia, not a uh, high grade. So this is another area where uh, cytokeratins, uh, P53, other stains can be very useful uh, in firming up your diagnosis of likely uh, mixed, uh, mixed malignant mullerian tumor or carcinosarcoma. <clears throat> Here's uh, another uh, fairly uh, classic example of a uh, uh, macrocystic type of lesion, but one where you might wonder about other entities like, uh, you know, uh, yolk sac tumor or uh, other kinds of things that can, can have that appearance. Uh, but as we come into higher magnification, we see a lot of uh, lumpy, bumpy, sort of uh, hobnailish type of formations in these cells. Um, and so we would think about a uh, a macrovesicular or polyvesicular uh, 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 clear cell carcinoma. But in this case, the cells aren't clear. And so, uh, you know, is this really a clear cell carcinoma or is it something else? And so again, that's another scenario where immunohistochemistry uh, may be useful in validating your clinical impression uh, based on the initial morphology.
So this is a chart that I worked up on uh, the differentiation using some of the more frequently available and frequently useful uh, immunohistochemical chemical stains uh, that can differentiate most all of these uh, tumors. Uh, so um, endometrioid tumors uh, will almost universally be Pax8 positive. They tend to have a patchy or splotchy pattern with P16, uh, express a wild type phenotype of P53, uh, not react with napsin, have strong hormonal positivity. Uh, and that's a very reliable uh, phenotype. In contrast, serous carcinomas, usually Pax8 positive, but also will be P16 positive, uh, and that's useful as a co-validator for the P53 mutation status, uh, particularly in cases where uh, you're dealing with a null mutation. Hormone receptors can be uh, variable, usually uh, much less uh, prominent than with endometrioid, and then these tumors may be HER2 positive, and that becomes an important therapeutic target in some circumstances. Clear cell carcinoma, less frequently Pax8 positive. P16 is variable. Uh, again, usually wild type P53, but can occasionally be mutated. Uh, and uh, Napsin A is characteristically positive in this tumor. With the caveat, however, that this positivity can be somewhat patchy. Uh, we also can use HNF1 beta uh, as a marker for this uh, clear cell change. Uh, and that's useful in this setting, but it's not totally pathognomonic. It's fairly sensitive, but not entirely uh, specific. With undifferentiated tumors or dedifferentiated carcinomas, we often lose markers. So, so uh, Pax8 cytokeratins even may be lost in that situation. P16 may be negative or only splotchy. P53 is usually wild type. Uh, ERPR often lost, but may be variably expressed. Um, but what these tumors do tend to have in common is some sort of abnormality in the SWI SNF locus uh, of cell proliferation uh, markers. And that's a, a combination of three markers, INI1, BRG1, or ARID1A or 1B, uh, one of which usually is lost. Um, now, interestingly, these patients also, in a fair number of cases, can be mismatch repair deficient. Um, and so uh, that's also important to recognize. Uh, and we routinely do that in, in most circumstances. Carcinosarcomas most of the time have uh, positive Pax8, especially in the carcinomatous component. Uh, the P16 may be splotchy or it may be strongly positive if uh, we're dealing with a P53 mutation status. Uh, of course, they're negative with uh, napsin A and uh, variable with uh, ERPR, depending on the type of carcinoma this element that's present. This is a diagnosis made much easier if you see bone or cartilage or characteristic uh, muscle elements that classify it as truly having heterologous elements. Now, something that we don't often consider in our diagnoses is the mesonephric and mesonephric-like carcinomas. And these are a pitfall because these will be Pax8 positive, uh, just like endometrial tumors. And so if we're just doing Pax8 uh, and this other routine marker set, uh, we may miss uh, the mesonephric type tumors and just classify them as a small cell or small gland variant of endometrial tumors. They usually have a slightly different look. Um, and their staining with hormone receptors, however, is usually negative. And that should be a clue uh, to think beyond the classic endometrioid, because this feature of hormone receptor positivity is quite strongly preserved. And you can then use GATA3 or TTF1 or both uh, to verify that this is more of a mesonephric type. Finally, much less frequently, the mucinous intestinal type of tumors usually Pax8 negative, variable with P53. And these will have enteric markers like CK7, CK20, CDX2, and also possibly E. cadherin positive. Uh, so uh, we rarely encounter those, but uh, they will have, a, again, a different look. Although mucinous tumors can overlap with these endometrioid tumors. So if you have a Pax8 negative tumor with sort of a tall glandular endometrioidish look, uh, you should consider mucinous intestinal tumors.
So here's a couple of examples, uh, looking at some of these earlier uh, tumors. Uh, here, I believe we have um, a uh, P53 stain. And uh, this uh, particular case uh, illustrates uh, uh, nicely um, a couple of things. One is um, large sections of tissue may stain variable in different areas. And that's oftentimes due to the degree of per penetration uh, that is present for the uh, antibody. Uh, but this is one of those problematic patterns with P53 where we have uh, both cytoplasmic and new significant nuclear staining here. Uh, and so a lot of times people look at this and say, oh, not nuclear positivity, this must be a negative or aberrant reaction. And so they go on and classify it as as negative or wild type or something. But in fact, this is the rarest of all the positive uh, types where you get this cytoplasmic and mucinous uh, positivity uh, in the cells that is characteristic of um, a mutated P53 status. Um, and so here we have some of the classic architecture and sometimes uh, these little papillae are not particularly staining uh, strongly and well, uh, but we do have this very characteristic uh, pattern uh, so I think this is just one of those little pitfalls to be aware of. Uh, not a classic pattern, but uh, indeed one that still should be classified as uh, mutated. Uh, more typically, we'll see uh, the either the overexpressed in virtually 100% of the tumor cells or the null pattern with no expression in the tumor cells. Uh, but this cytoplasmic and nuclear pattern uh, is also indicative of P53 uh, mutation. Now, this is a supposedly a wild type. It's actually a little bit overexpressed uh, than what I often see in a wild type, which looks a little closer to this uh, null type, but will have occasional positive cells uh, in the tumor cell component, as well as the positive uh, stromal cells. So here's a, another uh, immunohistochemical stain uh, that we can uh, evaluate. This is P16, um, and uh, this is uh, uh, illustrative of a, uh, the pattern that you typically see with endometrioid tumors. Now, the slightly uh, atypical feature here is that all of the squamous morules in this uh, lesion are staining positive. But the glandular component, as you can see here, has this occasional positive cells uh, or so-called splotchy or model pattern of positivity. I don't have a great explanation for why the morials are staining positive. I don't think this is HPV related, but it is uh, certainly something to be aware of. Now in mesonephric-like carcinoma, adenocarcinomas or mesonephric carcinomas, uh, the staining pattern is uh, quite uh, unique. Uh, as we've mentioned, these can be GATA3 positive, and here's a nice uh, illustration of the various markers and patterns that can be observed uh, from this fairly recent article in Diagnostics. Negative or minimal uh, hormone reactivity, wild type uh, P53 expression, uh, modeled P16 expression, some CD10 positivity, not in the stroma, but in the glandular element. And then uh, the TTF1 uh, strong to uh, variably heterogeneous uh, positivity can also be observed. So that's a very interesting and unique uh, pattern with mesonephric-like carcinomas. Uh, here's an example from our recent history. Um, this actually was that case where we were wondering about carcinosarcoma with a sort of sarcomatoid component. Uh, this is the uh, GATA3 stain. Um, and as you can see, uh, this is nicely staining in the, the majority of these nuclei uh, so this is not an endometrioid carcinoma transitioning to carcinosarcoma. This is a, uh, a, a uh, <clears throat> mesonephric-like tumor that is and actually was uh, transitioning to a sarcomatoid uh, uh, differentiation uh, area uh, with loss of that marker. As you can see in this small glandular area we illustrated before, there's loss of the GATA3 marker. Uh, so uh, tumors can do strange things, but uh, losing markers as they become less differentiated or more aggressive is certainly uh, one of those uh, things that they hold in their bag of tricks. <clears throat> uh, this is that same tumor again, I believe. 
And uh, here our marker is uh, with PAX-8. So as you can see, um, this would be a setup to uh, regard this as a, an endometrioid tumor if you're just thinking ovary, endometrioid, uterus uh, type of uh, cancers. Uh, this, uh, it done in isolation, might lead, lead you to lean upon that possibility. So don't all think of uh, PAX-8 as solely a gynecologic tract uh, marker. Remember that it can be positive in uh, your genital uh, tumors uh, and uh, uh, particularly those that have uh, mesonephric type uh, origins. Now, I, would, this talk would not be complete if we didn't uh, mention the molecular subtypes of endometrial carcinoma, which are becoming increasingly uh, important to recognize and report. Uh, so this uh, uh, information derives from the uh, Tumor Cancer Genome Atlas uh, data published in 2014. Uh, which uh, categorized endometrial carcinomas into four major groups. Those with uh, so-called copy number high or TP53 mutations, those with copy number low, which were generally grouped into no specific molecular phenotype, which is not saying they didn't have uh, molecular mutations, but there was nothing highly characteristic or demonstrable or unifying in that group. Um, as well as the mismatch repair deficient group or so-called MSI high group and the DNA polymerase epsilon or pole mutated uh, group, uh, which also could be classified as ultra mutated. Now, uh, these uh, phenotypes are very, or these molecular subtypes are very useful in predicting behavior, uh, sometimes in predicting responsiveness to uh, different types of therapy, including radiation or chemo or specialized markers like checkpoint inhibitors and so forth. Um, but they don't have a unifying um, immunohistochemical uh, pathway that allows you to dif differentiate them. In specifically, we'd say the ultramutated or POL-E uh, tumors, uh, these are rarely uh, recognized to have P53 mutation, but can. Uh, they can be variable with hormone receptors. Um, they're usually intact with uh, uh, mismatch repair proteins. Um, and some of these tumors are high grade. The challenge here, of course, is that when you looked at survival data for these patients, these pole tumors had extraordinarily good survival, even though they were high grade, awful looking tumors in many cases. Now, in contrast, uh, mismatch repair deficient tumors, we can often identify uh, by using mismatch repair proteins, MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2 to screen for these defects. Um, or we can use the uh, molecular assay, the uh, MSI high or intact. Uh, the copy number high uh, cases uh, are usually P53 mutated. Um, they often have weak or lost ERPR, and usually the MMR is intact, though not always. There are some overlaps there. And these are patients where HER2 is useful. So immunohistochemistry still plays a role in both identifying and managing these uh, cases, but can't fully discriminate between uh, the ultramutated pulled uh, cases and many of these other uh, types. Um, the copy number low, the sort of no specific molecular uh, type, uh, usually has wild type P53, strongly positive hormone receptors, and intact uh, mismatch repair uh, genes. So um, here is a, a nice example of uh, a mismatch repair uh, evaluation uh, using, I believe, MLH1. And as you can see here, uh, we have uh, a dilemma uh, because uh, much of this tumor is uh, clearly retaining the tumor, uh, retaining the marker, as you can see here, a nice strong nuclear expression in this tumor. But when we look at uh, this little fragment of tumor over here, uh, we get instead the reverse of that. All the stromal cells are positive, but these tumor cells are uniformly negative. So um, not all of these cases are clear cut. In general, we report and grade based on the predominance of uh, whether things are retained 
or uh, lost. Um, but uh, we don't always, we don't yet completely know what to do with these uh, categories where we have a, uh, a subclone or a small area of the tumor that has lost one of these markers. We know it certainly doesn't mean that there's a germline mutation, but there may be some methylation going on and that sort of thing in part of the tumor as it evolves that leads to loss. And the significance of that, particularly relative to therapy using the checkpoint inhibitors like Keytruda and so forth, is yet to be fully established. So I like this little diagram, which kind of helps us to look at this in terms of uh, both the histologic types and the molecular events that are going on. Um, this is a reference from the uh, International Journal of Gynecologic Pathology, which uh, shows you kind of uh, this grouping of low-grade endometrial tumors that can include you know, mismatch repair deficiency, occasionally the initiating uh, events that could lead to dedifferentiation, um, and uh, the other pathways that can be involved. In contrast, uh, we also know that some of these well-differentiated or low-grade tumors will be pole E. Some of them will be MSI high, and a majority of them perhaps will be um, uh, copy number low or um, no specific phenotype. In contrast, when we look to the um, uh, P53 mutated group, which is all of this group over here, that can include some high-grade endometrioid, of course, our serous tumors, sometimes mixed phenotypes, malignant Mullerian mixed tumor, and even sometimes clear cell carcinoma. And so that uh, creates some particular challenges because even in this group, occasionally you will get uh, mismatch repair defects as well. Uh, I said usually before in that uh, table. So this, uh, I think, nicely portrays to some degree a little bit more of the complexity of what's going on uh, in these uh, particular types. Um, and we haven't yet begun doing HER2 uh, testing on all of our P53 uh, phenotypes. We just do it on the serous uh, type. Um, but uh, there certainly may be reasons to begin to think about that as well. And perhaps other uh, mutational testing uh, as more targeted therapies become available. Well, <clears throat> to sort of summarize, I think uh, we need to recognize that we live in a, a brown stain era. And therefore, using immunohistochemistry uh, to its uh, maximal potential can be very, very helpful in differentiating the histologic types of endometrial carcinomas, and also can put us a long way towards uh, identifying some of the molecular subtypes of endometrial carcinoma. With that, we'll sort of wrap up uh, today's uh, uh, discussion. Thank you so much uh, for joining me. Uh, we do encourage you to subscribe so that as future videos are released, you'll be able to catch those. And as always, if you have uh, questions, don't hesitate to reach out and contact me. I'm always eager for contact and uh, connection uh, with uh, our listeners and viewers. And uh, welcome your suggestions or uh, comments on uh, what we're doing. So until next time, thanks so much for joining me.